Welcome to Victory Church Craddock. Thank you, Erika. Thank you. Is it on? Can you hear me? Okay. All right. Hi, everyone. The church grew <laughs> during worship. I was like saying to God, you know, it's cold. It's okay if there's only five people, but look at all you beautiful people. And thank you so much for coming out um, in the cold. Thank you for my mom. <laughs> who's here tonight. <laughs> I didn't expect that. Thanks, Mommy. Um, what an honor and a privilege to be in this house and to be with this family. I'm, I'm so excited. So thank you for coming out. So tonight I want to talk to you about, um, or out of my favorite book of the Bible, which is Revelation. And it's not a scary book. It's not a book full of mysteries. It's actually very plain and clear. Yes, there are some mysteries that God will reveal to us later in time. But it's such a good tool that we can use to see the condition of our hearts and our churches and what pitfalls to look out for. It shows us that we serve a holy God. It shows us how to worship Him. It gives us hope in Jesus' victory and what we as overcomers can look forward to. Revelation, it's not revelations, like Will said this morning. <laughs> There's a couple who like to correct people. But Revelation um, is the only book in the Bible that commands a blessing to the person who reads it. So I want to encourage you, go and read it and go see what Jesus has to say because it's his revelation. It's a revelation he gave to John. So it's Jesus' words to us today. So let's incline ourselves to this book and hear what he says. So I want you to take your right hand. Everyone got a right hand? Grab your ear. Have you guys got an ear? Okay, great stuff. William, is that an ear or is that an ornament on the side of your face? <laughs> exactly, I sound like my mother. <laughs> okay, so that now that we've established that we've all got ears to hear, it says in Revelation at least seven times, I think even maybe eight times, it says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. I think Jesus knew, and I actually know that Jesus knew that we would still be reading this book in 2024. And he makes it relevant today, especially the letters to the seven churches. So let's listen in here. But first of all, true story. We have a cousin whose wife was extremely worried about him because she thought he was suffering extreme hearing loss because he would never hear when she or the kids would talk to him and um, it was becoming a big problem in the household. So they went to the audiologist and they did all these tests and um, waiting for the test results, we're sitting there chatting and the audiologist comes out and says, Sir, your hearing is ac absolutely 100%. There's nothing wrong with your hearing. But I do think you need to work on your listening skills true story. <laughs> so I want us tonight and in the weeks to come, can we practice our listening skills and hear what it is that Jesus has to say for us? Okay. So the churches. John wrote to seven actual churches. It's important to know that it's not just a church that he thought up. These were actual churches that existed in the day. And as always, we need to read the Bible in um, context. So we need to kind of figure out who they wrote the book to um, and what was written would have meant to the people in the day. So when you read your Bible, read it um, with that in mind. Don't go and take scripture out of context. It's a very bad thing to do. So all seven letters are important, um, but I've chosen two. I've, I want to concentrate on the letter to Ephesus and the letter to Laodicea. Because if you have the problem that the uh, Ephesians faced, you're going to have the problem that the Laodiceans faced. When you read the letters, and I do want, you to well, want to encourage you to go and read all of them, you'll see there's a structure to the letters. There's the addressee, who it's written to, and you will find one of the reasons Jesus chose those specific churches in the meaning of the name of the church. So go and see what the name of the church means. Then if you're not sure who Jesus is, there are beautiful titles for Jesus in each and every letter. And they're beautiful. And even in Revelation 1, go and see who Jesus is. 
then there's a commendation or praise or good news for that church. Then there's criticism or bad news. Then there's an exhortation or a reprimand. Then there's a piece that says, he that has an ear, let him hear. And then there's a promise to the overcomer. When you go study these books for yourself, you will note that there are two churches that have got absolutely no praise. There's nothing good said about them. Those churches are in danger. But then there are two who have got no criticism. So go and study these uh, churches because they're all relevant today. All right. So let's dig into the letter to the church in Ephesus. So Ephesus was a Greek city. And we must remember that um, mythology to us is their history. The Greeks regarded their uh, mythology to us as their history. They had a big temple that was dedicated to the worship of Artemis or Diana, the daughter of Zeus, the twin sister to Apollo, and it was a major city for the practice of magic. So it was a very paganistic um, church or city. In Acts 20, Paul gives the elders of the Ephesian church a prophetic warning against false teachers who could easily infiltrate the church and lead them astray. And this was, had a lot to do with the pagan practices and the worship of other gods. Um, they really believed in magic. And in, I think in Acts 18, Paul instructed the new Christians to burn their magic books. Because the old has passed away, the new has come. Don't hold on to what is past. And those books were expensive. I think the amount of books that were burnt in those days, if they had burned it today, it, it would be, um, I think, worth over a million dollars. I can't even put that into rand. It just doesn't make sense to me. So we're not allowed to cling on to past stuff that will come back to lead us astray. He also reminds the elders um, that he declared all the counsel of God to them. So he's reminding us and them that the best way to recognize a lie is to already know the truth. And that is why it's so important to store God's word in your mind and in your heart. This is the truth. This is what we need to know. We cannot be led astray if we know the truth. If someone's going to tell you a lie, trying to deceive you, your spirit's already going to go, no, that's not right. I know the truth. So the word Ephesus means desirable. It shows us that Jesus desires this church, and he's calling her back. He's calling her back to him, and we'll see why. So if you want to, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Revelation 2, and we'll start in verse 1. Okay. So it says... To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Now people don't know what that means, but it's really easy. The stars are the angels of the church and the lampstands are the churches. Holding the stars in his hands means that he is in control. And walking among the lampstands means he's walking among the churches, as he still is today. He walks among us. Then in verse 2, he says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. He says to them, I know what you are doing. He's paying attention, just as he is today. He knows exactly what we're doing. He knows exactly who you are. He knows exactly where you're at. And then he goes on to say, I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. So Jesus is pleased that they were very diligent in watching out for deceivers. They were dedicated to his word and they did not let any heresy creep in. Then in verse 4, there's a scary little word this word yet or nevertheless. So he's happy with what they're doing, but nevertheless, I'll hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Ah, they left their first love. You see, they gave all their heart to the service of the king, 
but they completely forgot to delight themselves in the king. You see, the problem with the Ephesus church was that they had so much head knowledge, but they had no real affection. There was no love, comfort, or care for each other. They were spot on on their doctrine, but they lacked the love of Jesus. Years earlier, Paul says in Ephesians 1 verse 15 to 16, Ever since I heard of your strong faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. So they had the love for people, but somewhere along the line, they lost it. And the issue is not what I was taught when I was little, is that we've lost our love for Jesus. That's not true. You lose the love of Jesus. You lose the ability to show people the love of Christ. And the warning that Jesus gives is not that they will lose their salvation, but there is something that they will lose. In verse 5, he says, Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. That's scary. What happens when you remove a lampstand? It becomes dark. So what, Paul, or what Jesus is saying here is that they would lose their witness to the world. Their light would go out because of their failure to show the love of God to the world. How many churches today, how many of us are so focused on right doctrine, on doing church right, that we forget to show the world the overwhelming love and forgiveness of Christ? the way that we were shown. So what is it to love Jesus and to know his love? Love is the first name fruit of the Spirit um, in Galatians 5. Agape love is what we're talking about. And agape love is an unconditional love. It's a kind of love that we find in a marriage and it's so beautiful. It's a kind of love where we can just be in each other's presence and enjoy each other. It's a kind of love where we genuinely care for each other's welfare and we are willing to lay down our life for another person. It's a kind of love where we are simply doing the dishes, taking the turn with the baby, making a cup of coffee, going to buy <laughs> groceries just to make the other person's burden a little lighter. This kind of love is doing something out of kindness rather out of, than out of obligation. I don't want people to love me because they're obligated to. I want them to love me for who I am. And maybe I'm not the best I can be right now, but I want them to love me for the best I will be, the best Jesus is making me. Isn't that what we want? from Jesus and from one another. It's a close, personal, tender love. So love is this. Love is to expect the best of someone, to stick with them, and to refuse to give up on them. If you find that kind of love in a church, you know that church is where Jesus is. He doesn't give up on us. Can you imagine treating every person you meet with the love of Christ. And it's so beautiful, Jeannie shared two weeks ago. Can you imagine treating every single person as if they were Jesus? Because isn't that who we ultimately love? So if you love people with the love of Christ, how differently would you treat people? How would you treat the beggar on the street? How would you treat that annoying coworker? How would you treat the person who deeply hurt and offended you. Would you treat them the same? So our first aim is this, to have a deep, close relationship and love with our Father, with Jesus, and with Holy Spirit. It has to be a love that is so close that we know God's heartbeat for ourselves and for others. It's a kind of love that I share with my husband. We can be in a crowded room and we can look at each other and we know exactly what the other one's thinking. 
And more often than not, it is like, honey, I'm overwhelmed. I've had enough. I want to go home, wind it down. Five minutes, I get you in the car. <laughs> That's me. And my husband's love is so kind. He knows that. And he does that for me. So the failure of the Ephesian church is a big deal, guys. Jesus instructs them to repent of their loveless condition. Change your mind about people. Change the way you act around people. If they do not, he will remove their lampstand and their witness to the world will be gone. Don't let your witness to the world be snuffed out. Don't get so offended by people that you don't love them. Good works without the love of Jesus, it's dead works. Perfect doctrine and doing church right without love, absolutely worthless. So I often say to people, be Jesus to someone. And I get these weird looks like, what, what, what do you mean? I simply mean that you need to love people with the love of Jesus and that you need to see them through his eyes and treat him, treat them the way that he would treat you or them. Now that that scary reprimand is over, he does have something positive to say. He says, but you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. And yes, Jesus uses the word hate. There are things that he hates. So no one is actually sure who the Nicolaitans were, but if we look at the meaning of the word, Nico means victor over or lord over, and Laos means the people. So it means to lord over people or to victor over people. So Jesus says that he hates it when someone lords their leadership or their knowledge or their I'm better than you in my faith over people. He placed pastors and teachers and elders and preachers and mentors in our lives to build us up, to train us up in the knowledge of Christ and to equip us so that people can walk in the fullness of their calling. People, pastors and priests and eldership aren't there to be revered. We are not here to follow people. If you are in a church because you're following William, I go to that church because I follow William because he's a great preacher. Or I go to Life Group because I follow Rion because he's funny and he makes me feel good. If that person leaves, your world's going to come crashing down because your foundation isn't built on truth. Your foundation isn't built on following Jesus, then you're following people. And people will always disappoint. People leave. Don't do that. Then verse 7 says, Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Have you got an ear? Are you hearing? <sighs> no, no, no. <laughs> then he says, To the one who is victorious or to the overcomer, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. The overcomer is the one who has an ear to hear. The overcomer is the one who's teachable. And it's so beautiful because he gives us this beautiful picture of us in heaven eating from the tree of life. We've got a glimpse into heaven. Yes, heaven is here. King, the kingdom is within us. But there's even more to come that we can look forward to. So if we're a loveless church, because that is what the church in Ephesus is called, they're the loveless church, then you're probably going to experience the problem that the church in Laodicea faced. So let's turn to Revelation 3 and we read from verse 14. To the angel of the earth, church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Jeez. That's a bit scary. So background about the church in Laodicea. Um, they didn't have their own water supply. They 
relied on water from two nearby cities, um, Hierapolis and Colossia. I hope I'm saying those names right. Hierapolis was very well known for their hot springs. So the water that flowed through the aqueducts from these hot springs arrived at Laodicea at a lukewarm temperature. The water coming from Colossia, on the other hand, was cold, and as it flowed through the aqueducts to Laodicea, it warmed up in the sun, and it reached the city lukewarm. So the Laodiceans knew exactly what God meant, or Jesus meant, when he said, you are lukewarm. They understood that lukewarm is bad. Cold water was healthy water. Hot water was good water because it killed all the bacteria and the lava and the yuck that was in the aqueduct. They knew lukewarm was bad. And did you know that lukewarm water at the specific lukewarm temperature is used to induce vomiting? That is why Jesus says, I'm about to spit you out. He's saying, I'm about to vomit you out. That's not good, guys. Can you imagine the shock and the horror for a church who knows very well what lukewarm is when they hear Jesus says, you lukewarm and I'm going to spit you out. Jesus doesn't want lukewarm and half-hearted people. He wants people that are on fire, that are hot, that can burn away all the yuck. Lukewarm people are dangerous people because they think that they're doing great and they're just sliding by, they're doing just enough. I've got my salvation, going to heaven, I'm good. Every now and again, I'm going to give to ministry just so that I've done my part. I'm going to be in church on a Sunday, but Monday to Saturday, I'm going to live in the world. Lukewarm's bad, guys. It's very dangerous. But let's read on. Verse 17 says, You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. So Laodicea was a very wealthy church. The, the uh, city was wealthy. They had a great banking system. They traded in very fine textiles made out of black sheep's wool. And they had a medical center and physicians that had made an eye ointment. There was apparently some other eye problem and they had the cure for that. Um, so they were very well known for that. So this wealthy church made a big mistake because they thought that wealthy meant that they were blessed by God. But money does not represent God's stamp of approval on anything. They were very lax because all their physical needs were met and they thought they had it made. So today it might be one of those churches who's got like all the bells and whistles. They've got the best cafe, they've got the best barista, they've got the best worship team money can buy, they've got the best sound equipment, they've got all the bells and whistles. But Jesus calls them wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. In verse 18, he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Jesus totally contrasts their versions of wealth and prosperity. He says instead of gold, he will give them godly character refined by fire. Instead of the high-quality textiles, he will give them pure, white, spiritual clothes, robes of righteousness. And instead of physical sight, he will give them the ability to see the truth. In verse 19, he says, Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Jesus rebukes and disciplines those who he loves. So if you get disciplined or reprimanded, it's never nice, but it's just a course correction. 
And Jesus only does that because he loves you and he wants you to be the best you that you can be. The person that he has created you to be. So don't be afraid of reprimand. But repent. Change your mind. Change your ways. Then in verse 20 he says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. So Jesus doesn't give up on them. Jesus isn't withholding himself from them. He's standing at the door knocking. He's not yet inside the church, but he's waiting to be let in. He was once part of the church, but somehow something blocked him. Can you imagine people, you having people um, at your house, having a party, say, and you're locked out of your own home, and you're standing and they're knocking, and people are ignoring you, and they're not letting you in. How do you feel? Can you imagine Jesus standing outside of that door tonight, knocking, and us ignoring him? Jesus was shut out of his own church. In Luke 12, verse 35 to 37, he says, Be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning as though you were waiting for your master to return from the wedding feast. Then you will be ready to open the door and let him in the moment he arrives and knocks. The servants who are ready and waiting for his return will be rewarded. I tell you the truth, he himself, that's Jesus, will seat them, put on an apron, and serve them as they sit and eat. All they need to do is open the door. He wants to come in and join and dine with them. Isn't that such an intimate and warm invitation from Jesus? There are people sitting here tonight, and Jesus is knocking at your door. Are you going to let him in? So Laodicea means the rule of the people. So the huge problem with this church was that the church was ruled by popular opinion. And that's why Jesus was shut out. They were not looking to Jesus as their leader. They were looking to people and what people wanted. We're going to draw the masses. What do the people want? more worship, more this, more that. Let's do more bells and whistles. What are we allowed to preach on? What are we not allowed to preach on? What's your opinion? And we see this in many churches today. There are many te- uh, churches who choose their pastors and their duomenes and their priests on what they feel their church can handle. No, we're not going to allow this person to come and preach or be our pastor because he believes in spiritual gifts. He speaks in tongues. Mm. No, we're not going to allow him to come here because we don't agree with him on this. The rule of the people. This type of church is a user-friendly and easily compromises to please the people and the culture of the day. We don't want a user-friendly church. We want a church based on biblical truth. So Jesus was once part of the church, but he was shut out because they chose to be ruled by the people's opinion and not by biblical truth. So culture today is the belief in liberty and freedom and to do what makes you happy. Follow your heart. Do whatever makes you happy. Jesus just wants you to be happy, man. Go do whatever it is you want to do. Follow your heart. No. The word says that our heart is the most deceitful thing. We cannot follow our heart. We have to follow Jesus. We have to follow the plan that he has laid out for us. And if we follow our hearts, where do we draw the line? That means we can just do whatever we please. Can we allow culture to tell us what to think and how to behave? Do we follow the world or do we follow God? 
The world's culture today no longer believes in sin because it's inconvenient and it's uncomfortable. But Jesus declared that there are two great commandments. Love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. Doesn't that sound like what Jesus told the church in Ephesus? Love requires us to speak the truth. And we do so with wisdom and guidance from the Holy Spirit and with the love of God. But we need to speak the truth. Unfortunately, our culture, in our culture, people no longer believe in truth. And like the church in Laodicea, they care far more about popular opinion and biblical, than biblical truth. How many churches are allowing same-sex marriage? to popular opinion I might offend but it's the truth so what is biblical truth biblical Christianity is not all inclusive and it's not particularly tolerant people don't want to hear that biblical truth insists that Jesus is the only way to God John 14 6 says I am the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me Jesus is the only way to God. No other way. Biblical truth is that Jesus is the amen, the faithful true witness, the ruler of creation. Biblical Christianity does not leave space or wriggle room for other belief systems, and this puts people off. There's a movement called the ecumenical movement, and that is where we all love Jesus. It doesn't matter if I believe that Jesus was just a prophet. It doesn't matter if I believe, I don't really need to believe that Jesus is the only way to God. We all get to the same God. That is an absolute lie. Jesus is the only way to get to the Father. Jesus is the only way for us to be saved. Biblical truth is Jesus forgiving an adulteress but tells her to go and sin no more. And like William said this morning, it is so beautiful. Yes, we don't want to sin. Our old nature is gone. We have new DNA. We've got the Father's DNA within us. But we do fail sometimes. But the great news is that we have an advocate in heaven that pleads our case for us. And we're shameless. And we're blameless. And we've got God that says, not guilty. That's biblical truth. Biblical truth is that there are only two genders, male and female. It says so in Genesis. Biblical truth is that marriage is a sacred covenant between one man and one woman. Biblical truth is that we are in this world, but we are not of this world. That's biblical truth. You will find it all in here, guys. This is the guide. If you're not sure what biblical truth is, if you're confused by what culture is telling you and what biblical truth is, read your word. It's all in there. You guys need to realize that there's a spiritual battle raging out there. The word says we're not fighting flesh and blood. And if you're a lukewarm Christian, it means that you are sitting on the sidelines because you're just skating by. When you're on the sidelines, you are not fighting. And if you're not fighting, it means Satan takes round. And when Satan takes ground, he's taking hearts and lives. We can't afford that, people. We have to fight spiritually for those around us by loving them with the love of Christ and by being on fire for the Lord and speaking truth into people's lives. We actually don't even need to speak truth into people's lives. We just need to make sure that our lampstands are filled with oil, that our lamps are burning so that people can see the truth and the light in us. We are the witness to the world. Then we come to the promise to the overcomer. Jesus says, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my, on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. 
Guys, we are seated in heavenly places with Jesus already. Remember, Jesus became human just as we are, yet he was sinless because he could see the beginning from the end. He could see straight into the throne room of God. And he knew that he was victorious. Guys, we know these things too. We have no excuse. We can enter boldly into the throne room of God just as Jesus did. And we can ask him for wisdom and we can ask him for help. We can ask him to show us the truth. We can ask him that his truth can cut deep into our heart to get all that messy gunk, lukewarm yuck out of our hearts. Because of Jesus, we are sinless and blameless before God. Jesus understands our battles. He overcame, and we are overcomers. He actually calls us overcomers more than conquerors. He calls us victorious. So I'm wrapping up in closing. (laughs) We cannot allow the world to tell us what to think. We have to question ourselves. Are we loveless? Are we lukewarm? Have we fallen into a worldly mentality towards sin? Are we allowing culture and worldly thinking to influence us? Are we all inclusive? Or are we exclusive in biblical truth, in Jesus' truth, in God's truth? And this is why we need to store God's word into our hearts and our minds because we need to know the truth so that we will not be led astray. It's the truth that sets us free. And we speak truth into people's lives with love. It doesn't mean that we shun people who aren't with Jesus. Jesus mingled with the lowest of the low. It doesn't mean that we need to set ourselves apart and not mingle with the people of the world. It just means that we need to be the light of the world. It means that we forgive. It means that we see them through the eyes of Jesus, that we love them with the love of Jesus. We don't condemn them, we don't judge them, as as William said this morning. But we love and we pray that they will have a meeting with God, that they will repent, and that they will come to know Jesus as we do. The truth sets us free. We are all called overcomers, more than conquerors, and we are victorious. Say that with me. I am an overcomer. I am more than a conqueror. I am victorious. I am a truth bringer. We can only be these things when we have an ear to hear. And I want to ask you tonight, are you hearing and are you listening? Let's pray. Thank you so much, Father, that we could come and we could just hear the truth that Jesus has revealed to us. Father, I pray that we will receive the wisdom and ask daily wisdom for us to have our lamps filled with oil, that we can be a bright, shining light in this world. Father, I pray that in the areas that we are lukewarm, that you will show us and that you will come and that you will reveal to us what it is we need to do to get rid of that, that we will be so on fire for you that the world around us can't but not change. Thank you that, Holy Spirit, you are the one who convicts and that we don't have to try and convince people of Jesus' love but that we can just come and show love to the people who need it. We are called to be the love of Christ. So Father, we just surrender tonight. And if you perhaps feel that you are lukewarm or that you have been loveless, why don't you just close your eyes and just repent of that and ask Jesus to come and show you those areas where we're too scared to speak truth into our families and into our friends.